Okie doke. So we just uh, put put a little motivation into our minds. Put some a pos- some positive thoughts. Just think think okay sitting here maybe all sorts of reasons why each of us came here you know but just think all right now that we're sitting in this room together let's make the most of it so let's think let's you know listen to what has to be said here listen to buddha's teachings you know basically buddha's psychology buddha's approach to life that's all this stuff is how to live your life how to see things how to perceive things how to develop our qualities so thinking, definitely I want to become more happy, more wise, less neurotic, less miserable. That's a certainty. And if I look around me, I can see that other people want the same, you know. So think, okay, I'm sitting here to listen to these teachings, think about their meaning, to see if there's some tools that I can take away, even one. You know, you can be a 1% Buddhist. It's really okay. Even if there's 1% of something I hear here that I can take away and use as a tool or, you know, move forward with so that I can develop my qualities so I can be a benefit to others, help them do the same thing for themselves. Think, this is why I'm here. Make this our reason. And I'm going to sing a little prayer, uh, the first two lines of which express one's reliance upon the Buddha. So anybody here who thinks already they are Buddhist, you have that in your mind. But the second two lines uh, really are expressing this motivation we just stated, this reason for being here, this reason for listening. You know, may I develop my qualities so I can be a benefit to others. Thinking like that. Sange chatan soke chognam la janjo badu dagni kyabsuchi dagi chen yen gipe sonam ki drola penchir sange drupa shok. Sange chadang soke chognam la janjo badu dagni kyabsuchi dagi chen yen gipe sonam ki drola penchir sange drupa shok. Sange chadang soke chognam la jancho badu dagni kyabsuchi dagi chen yen gi pe sonam ki drola penchir sange drupa shok. Okay. <coughs> So, first of all, just to remind us, you know, we might have heard this a thousand times, or maybe it's the first time we've heard these words, you know, remind ourselves how to listen, how to listen to these so-called Buddhist teachings. And I can't stress this point enough, you know. Uh, I think uh, in the West, you know, if if this were a science class or a cooking class, we would all know that it's something practical, you know. You would all know it would have to make sense and then you'd take the methods away and you'd try them out. And if they didn't work, you'd think, what an idiot. You'd demand your money back, you know. In other words, we would see it as something practical. But when it comes to being spiritual or religion, we lose our common sense. We don't think of it that it needs to be practical. We just think, oh, you you get all a bit excited when you hear it and it sounds a bit nice and interesting. Oh, I can believe in this and I'll believe in that. No, I don't want to believe that. And we sort of put these little things in our kit bag and then we walk away and we think, oh, well, now I'm a Buddhist because I believe certain things. Well, you know, the Buddhist approach is that's completely superstitious. The bottom line is for the Buddha, you know, as much as it is spirit, as much as it is religion, yes, you can say that. You ask any Tibetan, are you religious? They'll say yes. But for for the Buddhists, and particularly you could say this is strongly stressed among the Tibetans, there's no contradiction between religion and being practical. Religion and its being a practical thing. And it, so for the Buddha, first of all, first point, he's not a creator. This is probably the, the major difference between what's called... Um, doesn't sound very strong, this thing. Are you meant to hear me from this? Can you hear me? No. Okay. Um, you know, the Buddhist... Okay, that's just to have it sort of like that. That's okay. Yeah. Good. That's it. Thanks, Monia. Thank you. 
um, Buddha's not a creator. And like I'm saying, probably the major difference, one of the major differences between Buddhist religion and any, and any other religion is this point. It's a bit of a shock to us, in fact. Well, and we would assume, oh, well, therefore Buddhism isn't religion. So I think we have a, a, an assumption that religious religion means believing in a creator. This seems to be the defining characteristic. But that's not the Buddhist approach. They're happy to own the word religion. And if you look at the trappings, I mean, you can't get more religious. Look at it, you know. <laughs> Buddhist nuns and prostrations. I mean, I do more prayers now as a Tibetan Buddhist than I ever did as a Catholic. So, you know, I've got all the trappings of religion. And so we've really got to check carefully in our mind what that means. What's the implication of this? Because I think if you look at our history over the centuries, now, anyway, at least in our European culture, religion was all there was. Any of the science, any art, any music was in the context of the Catholic Church, wasn't it? You know, medieval Europe. Well, the Tibetan culture is pretty similar. And this is the Buddhist approach. So what we can see in the West, in the Western culture, the European culture, over the centuries, as, you know, along with the, the, the development of people, you know, people like Galileo looking into the truth, finding and having microscopes and, you know, going from those X numbers to the Arabic numbers, suddenly things opened up and we began to develop what we call science. And so we can see we've got this complete split now, isn't it? More and more think what we mean by science is what you can verify. And what we mean by religion is, by, by definition, usually what you can't verify, what you have to believe in. Well, for the Buddhist, there's never a contradiction between these two things, and there's no such thing as merely believing in something. I think it's so important to remember that, because we can easily fall into the trap, you know, uh, when we hear about Buddhism. We bring our theistic religious views into the Buddhist one, and so we believe in the Buddha, we believe in karma, we don't believe in this one. That's not the point. It really isn't the point, and I cannot stress this enough. It's extremely important. And anyone who listens to the Dalai Lama teach can hear this. As he says, he points out, if you can prove from your own experience, you know, that Buddha is actually wrong in what he is asserting as the truth, then you must reject the Buddha. And that's shocking in religious terms. That's like heresy. But that is the Buddhist approach because Buddha is not a creator. And so once we've got that clear, then everything we hear, we hear it in a different way. But we've got to train ourselves to think this way because we're so used to thinking in the usual religious way, you know, believing and not believing, whether we like it or not. I don't care whether you like the fact that one and one is two. It either is or it isn't. So I don't care whether you like the idea of karma. Buddha's either right or he's wrong. And the onus is on you to find out. This is the approach, you know. It's really important to remember this because suddenly then it puts us in the seat. It puts us in the driving seat. It's up to me, in other words, to listen to see what Buddha says, to give it a go, to take it as a hypothesis, to act as if, and then to work with it, you know. So it takes time. You can't prove it overnight, just like E equals MC squared. You can't prove that Einstein's wrong overnight or right. It takes a while, but that's the approach. But my feeling is when it comes to religion, there's something in us that for those of us who find religion appealing, I think we get very intellectually lazy, you know. We'd rather merely just believe a bunch of things and leave it all comfortable. But it's, you know, it's just wasting your time. It, and you really can see the point of this, you know. If you go to school and your teacher tells you that one and one is two and you memorize it, which we do, but you never verify it, you never experience it, then you can even teach someone else that one and one is two. But explain it, you can't. Prove it to yourself, you're not sure. Are you seeing my point here? So we, all the learning we do in our life is this type of experiential learning. We understand it very well. We, we live our life in this way. Music, botany, carpentry, music, I mean, all these things, you name it. We just don't memorize it and then just spout it. But religion, that's what we do. And it's very kind. And no wonder we get fundamentalist. I'm right because I believe it. No, 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 I'm right because I believe it. Well, that's why we all have wars and fights, you know. There's no basis Therefore, there's no reasonableness about it. And it's kind of scary. That is the scary thing about how we've misused religion. Religion's fine, but we misuse it. The fundamentalism in us just, you know, and the intellectual laziness in us misuses it terribly. So all the more so when we have something foreign to our culture like Buddhism, I mean, these weirdo pictures, you know, what the hell does these mean? You know, so strange to us. I mean, we can't even begin to find a way to interpret these, um, these weird pictures. They're like some kind of strange dream, you know. So, 
don't just dismiss it or don't just think, oh, isn't that cute art? I mean, you can think that. It's quite interesting, this painting. If you look at it, it's totally unusual. But it's got some meaning, you know. So you either investigate the meaning of it, and this is what we're going to be talking here now, this so-called tantra. We have to investigate the meaning. We have to unpack it. We have to deconstruct it. We have to get to see what is it and how do you apply it. What's its <coughs> purpose? What does it mean, you know? And if it doesn't mean anything, well, excuse me, chuck it in the bin. Don't waste your time, you know? If something is merely symbolic, which is how we think of religion again, symbolic, who cares, you know? I mean, if one and one and two is only symbolic, but you can never actually get one and one is two, you can't actually have one thing, then don't waste your head. Get it out of your head, you know? Things have to be practical. This is extremely important. All the more so with something as seemingly esoteric as this, you know? Mystical. So let's see if we can unpack it all, get some meaning out of it. Which means, what are the experiential implications of it for me and my life? Because if there aren't, like I said, then you just you can go there, get your money back, and walk out the door and go home. Don't waste your time. And I'm really serious. I mean, Buddhism talks about faith, but if you analyse the the, the the Latin root of that of our word confidence with faith, confide, it means faith, fide, whatever the original one is, I don't know, with faith, confidence. But we say the word confident, it gives a sense that you've checked something and you're confident you're right. But faith, I believe in something, that doesn't sound like confidence, but actually the meaning of it is that, you know, confidence. Okay, so what is this tantra? Where does it fit? Well, the, the best way to really present it is from the, you know, this, the Tibetans have been very good over the centuries at packaging Buddha's teachings in a very practical, coherent way. You know, this person called Atisha, this great Indian scholar, master, you know, practitioner in the 11th century, was invited to Tibet to teach there. And when he, when he came, he kind of saw they'd lost the plot a bit, you know. Buddhism had been there since the 8th century, maybe, and Buddhism was flourishing by then. My goodness, it was. But he could see, because the Buddhist teachings which had been in India for a good thousand years before that, to 1,500 years, you know, and by now we're degenerating in India, that the, the Buddhist teachings, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist psychology, Buddha met, Buddhist metaphysics, all these things, had grown in many directions in many places, vast, I mean vast and deep, you know. So easily you could see, unless you're a pretty developed person, it was very easy to lose the way, to find out where everything fit. It's a bit like if someone said, go learn some music, and they just threw you all these kinds of music, all the trumpet music and all the classical and all the jazz, but no order, no structure. You understand? You'd be very confused. You wouldn't know where to begin. So how, look at our culture. We're so good at this. So some, you know, these kind musicians, these kind carpenters, these kind cook, you know, cooks have organized the material in nice, orderly, structured way. You start at grade one and you finish at grade 12. We learn everything like this and we understand it well and it makes it coherent for us. It makes it comfortable, even if it's a 20-year course. We know where we are, we know where we're heading and we know where we'll end up. And it's very kind of, it's very kind of consoling. You can kind of, you know where you're going. You're not confused. You've got a map, you know. But we don't think of spiritual practice like this, which is why we're always confused about it. We think it hit and miss. We think it's cross your fingers. And then if we take from our own religious background, you know, our own religious culture, and I'm not being rude about it here. I mean, I'm a Catholic. I'm very happy with my Catholic upbringing. But if we take the Catholic approach, for example, it necessarily mystifies it. It is considered arrogant to want to investigate the teachings. I remember talking to some wonderful nuns in Berkeley, and I was asking questions. What about this and what about that? Oh, we don't know. Oh, we don't know. It's a mystery. I said, but don't you want to know? They said, oh, no, no, no. We don't want to know. We will know when we go to heaven. Now, I'm not being rude. I really am not. That's fine if that's your approach. But that surely is not the Buddha's approach. And the reason is reasonable. The reason you have that approach in, say, Christianity is because God is the boss. Because God did create everything. And as the Pope said to Stephen Hawking, apparently, you know, that guy who come all the big bang business, this amazing English scientist, he thanked him, basically, for his hard work on discovering all the information up to the big bang. And he said, but don't go beyond that. 
He said, that's God's job, not yours. And that is reasonable if you posit a creator. But that is not the Buddhist view. And this point is not just some intellectual point, this whole business of believing, not believing. It's fundamental to the whole approach you will take to being a Buddhist or looking at Buddhism. You know, in this sense, you really can say, even though the matter we're dealing with seems like esoteric and religious, the, the approach is far sim- more similar to the approach of listening to Einstein or a mathematician than it is to the religious approach, the theistic one. In other words, Buddha, being not a creator, basically what Buddhism is, is Buddha's presentation and then the presentation of the great practitioners over the centuries of what he has found from his own experience to be the truth. So if I were Einstein and I've done some research and then I decide to call a meeting and I'm now going to present to you my findings and then if I start to say, well, I'm not really sure if this is right and I think this is this and I'm speculating this and I had a dream last night and somebody appeared to me and gave me this, you know, and and gave me this information, you'd call me a wacko and throw me out the door, you know. So if you want me, you know, if you're going to come to a lecture about what Einstein thinks, you've got to be sure that he knows what he's talking about. You don't have to believe him, but you, you want him to be confident. And then you want him to show you your, your, his findings so that you can take these yourself and go through the same process that he went through and come to the same conclusion or not, as the case may be. And if you do find a mistake in Einstein's thinking, he's the first person who'll be happy to see it. This is the approach in Buddhism. This is the approach. So, this Atisha in the 11th century, you know, coming from the great Mahayana traditions, which incorporated all the esoteric teachings known as Tantra in Tibet, you know, he then decided he'd put to, he'd package the teachings for the Tibetans in a very practical way, in an orderly way, such as if it were a course, you know, grade one, grade two, junior school, high school, university, postgraduate, as we call, you know. But he, of course he didn't call it that because that's our culture. They, they have this cute name in, in Tibetan for course, but they call it graded path. It's kind of sweet, isn't it? Lam rim. It means gradual path. Well, if you analyse the meaning of those words, that's the meaning of a course, isn't it? You start at the beginning and you gradually go through these steps and you conclude. Well, they call it lam rim. We would say it's a course. Good enough. So this course to enlightenment, basically, this lam rim, which he put together... What he essentially did was take the the main points of all of Buddha's teachings and present them in this orderly, orderly, experientially orderly, progressive, kind of step-by-step way, taking the essential points of Buddha's philosophy, psychology, metaphysics, the whole deal, you know? And so a person... So where Tantra fits is it's postgraduate. It's postgraduate, basically. So let's look at the bigger package and see how it fits. Because you know very well if you're going to do postgraduate studies in math, it implies you've done junior school, high school and university, doesn't it? And even if, you go, even if you're only 12 years old and you, you're going to postgraduate, it still implies you've been through those initial steps, even if it's very quick. You get my point? Even if you've sped through them, you can't, have a, you can't not go through those steps. You have to internally go through those steps, even if it's super quick. So it's a natural and logical thing that you're doing. And so the whole idea of Tantra is it's the most advanced approach. So also, given that you're going to be doing postgraduate in math, you know very well the point of all the math, whether it's grade one or postgraduate level, the principles are the same. It's just more advanced. Well, the same in Buddhism. So what's the essential point then? What are you trying to accomplish being a Buddhist? What is the point of all this stuff, you know? Well, it's quite simple, actually. We don't think it's... We think it's esoteric, you know, but it's not... It's simple. Everything's esoteric until you know it. French is esoteric until you learn it. You get my point? It's not inherently esoteric. Once you've learned French, it ain't esoteric. It's real simple. Well, everything, once you understand it, is simple. It goes without saying. But again, with religion, because we think we're not supposed to understand it, we make it esoteric and mystical in the sky as an absolute that in its nature it's esoteric. That's superstition, excuse me, you know. So the point, as far as Buddhism is concerned, is to, it's, it's where you apply, okay, what, okay if, you, if you're learning math, 
then you know you're using your mind and you've got to use a pencil and your finger, no doubt, and your fingers to write it down to help you. But basically using your mind. If you're going to be a musician, you've got to use your hands as well on that piano, right? But it still comes from your mind, doesn't it? And if you're going to be a, an athlete, you use your body. You have to start, you know, smarten up your body. But you're still using your mind too. You, your mind is the real boss. So this is the point in Buddhism. Buddha deals with the mind. Buddha's expertise is the mind. What Buddha's... He's not, he doesn't discuss a thing. He doesn't posit a thing called a spirit or a soul, which in its nature for us is something esoteric, mysterious, hard to understand, created by God, beyond ordinary. Buddha doesn't talk like that. He says, we have body and we have mind. That's it. So if this is true, well, then let's get very, very clear about what Buddha means by the mind. And we've, done, we've talked all about this before. If you've been here before, you've heard this before. But to, in order to understand the purpose of Tantra or the purpose of junior school, you have to understand this point. Because all of this stuff, all of this stuff, all of these teachings, all of these practices we know as Tantra, visualization and mantras and all this stuff, you know, three-year retreats and Lord knows what, all of it um, is simply a bunch of methods to help us develop our mind. That's it. Basically, Buddha is a psychologist. And I'm not trying to kid you here. He didn't use that word, did he? It's <coughs> Greek. We coined it fairly recently. He spoke Hindi or something. He didn't speak Greek. Okay? He used the word mind. Okay. So in Tibetan, the word for mind is the word sem. So even the term in Tibetan is interesting for a living being, a sentient being, this quaint phrase that we translate into English. The term for a living being is very tasty. It is, me, it is sem chen, mind having, a mind possessor. We are all mind possessors. So what defines us, as far as Buddha is concerned, is our possession of mind. In other words, in Buddha's terms, the difference between a live body and a dead body is the presence of mind or not. So let's get clear about what the mind is. And then if we've not heard this idea before, we take it as a hypothesis. Because Buddhism will collapse in a heap of stupidity if you don't take this as your hypothesis. That mind is not physical. So we know the word mind very well. We use it in our contemporary culture. But when we say it, we mean the brain. We mean the intellectual process. For the Buddha, he's very clear. There is mind, which is not physical. So in that sense, you could say he agrees with all the other religions that they posit something not physical, but he doesn't call it a soul. And he doesn't say it's mysterious. He calls it the mind. Second, you know, uh, this mind of ours too, the biggest, another major, major difference, quite a radical idea actually, quite, quite different, fundamentally different from all the religious views and the materialist psychological views, and again to take this as a hypothesis is crucial, is that your mind is not made by anybody else. This is a, quite a shock actually. If we're religious, we assume we're created by God. If we're materialist, we assume we're created by mummy and daddy, who, you know, did a bit of work, put the egg and sperm together, and made Rabina. We, I mean, we don't say they're our creator, but we're virtually saying they created us. And this is a very fascinating point, actually, my sense is. You know, we just assume this as an absolute truth. No one, we never question this. It doesn't even arise. We never question this point. But this is a fundamental point in Buddha's teachings. Fundamental, you know. So, of course, we can go into this, but, you know, take this as a hypothesis for the moment, and as any decent scientist would. So your consciousness, then, this word is used synonymously, mind or consciousness, they're used synonymously for the Buddha. They refer to that part of you that essentially isn't your body. And what is that? That's your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your unconscious, your subconscious, instinct, intuition, the entire spectrum of your inner experiences, Consciousness. More and more these days, actually, in the Western, uh, um, you know, sci um, scientific and psychological research that they're doing, there's sort of this vague idea of consciousness that might not be directly the brain, but is affected by it. There's more and more talk, you know, and about how we can change our mind. But the Buddha, this is his expertise. This is, he's been on about this for two and a half thousand years, and nothing much has changed. 
you know, and all his great, and all his the practitioners over the centuries, all the lineage masters over the over the centuries. You know, mind is absolutely fundamental. And when you study, say, in the Tibetan monastic tradition, where these guys study for twenty, thirty years, you, you, one of your main topics is the nature of mind. It is huge teachings in Buddhism about the nature of mind, what it is, what it isn't, how it functions, and then the psychological components of it. Buddhist psychology, in other words, very clear, in-depth model of how mind functions, and it's absolutely central to all of Buddhism. Not kidding to say, as Lama Yeshi, you know, the, uh, one of my teachers, as he would say, we need to learn to be our own psychologists, to be our own therapists. Not kidding. That's being what, that's what a Buddhist really is. A person who, through using Buddha's techniques, his very skillful, sophisticated psychological techniques called meditation, which we ridiculously mystify, you know, by using these you become profoundly, marvelously familiar with your own mind. In other words, Buddha's really good at learning introspection. That's his thing. You know, that's his expertise. Only even maybe the last hundred years since Mr. Freud... Are we, th are we even con we even contemplate the idea that by you know unraveling feelings and talking and psychotherapy and so on we can learn about ourselves? In other words, it's only in the last hundred years that we've discovered you don't, you, that the only way to learn about your mind isn't looking at a rabbit's brain, you know. And we think we invented this idea of introspection. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's two and a half thousand years at least old, and then the Hindus before that were pretty good at it. So it's a few thousand years old. But we're so, you know, again, we got, and we even hear, you know, you read the, the great literature of the Catholic saints. They're amazing at introspection. But because it's religion, we don't kind of respect it, you know. It's just kind of wacko stuff. So that's Buddha's expertise, is, is, is the mind. His talk about it, the, the model of it, how it functions. And crucially, of course, this is the point here, this is the context, the potential of our mind. The potential. So a person who's a Buddhist is doing the job of familiarizing themselves with their own mind so that they can change it, so that they can develop its potential. This is the point. So if you ask a Christian, what's your goal? It's to be in heaven with God. If you ask a materialist, not sure, you know, we're still trying to work it out. But if you ask a Buddhist, it's very simple. You know, diff different strands of Buddhism. But in this context here, it, it would be the words. The words are the Asian words are to become enlightened. Oh, that sounds cute. You know, what's that? Well, it's a psychological state, okay? Because you're only talking about your mind. You're not talking about your nose, or your eyelashes. It's your mind, okay? Or the word is to become a Buddha. Well, the word Buddha is very simple. You know, the term in sa the Sanskrit word Buddha, and the and the term in Tibetan for it Sangye. Two syllables, and the epistemol the the you know epistemol no yes of it is you know you've got the first syllable implies the complete removing of all the garbage, all the neuroses, all the pollution, all the misery, all the suffering. The second syllable implies the complete development of all the good qualities. So, very simply, the goal of being a Buddhist, and the Buddha would say that this potential is innate within all of us, is at the core of our being and is thus your goal, just naturally, is the complete removal from your mind of all the junk and the complete development of all the goodness within you. Or even more simply, removing all the badness and filling up with all the goodness. That's it. What a Buddha is, is a, perfect, a person whose mind has been perfected. This is how Buddhists talk. Now, this is already a fascinating point because you check again our assumptions that we do not even question. There's an assumption that, for example, okay, if we hear words like anger, depression, jealous, low self-esteem, anxious, right, we all know they're miserable. We don't go, oh, I was anxious yesterday. It was just wonderful. <laughs> we do not. You understand my point? We know whether it's inside you or whether you're on the receiving end of it, thanks a lot, horrible. We just know it. That's the badness stuff. Buddha would say our suffering that suffering comes from this stuff in our minds. So there's no guilt or shame there. It's like a practical psychological point he's making. And if you check it up for more than a second, I think we'll agree it's, it's not pleasant. It's called suffering. Then we check the words love, kindness, compassion, generosity, patience, joy. And you all know when you hear them, they're nice ones. 
you know and if you're on the receiving end of them they're nice too so this stuff is kind of so simple it's almost embarrassing we this is the, this goodness and this badness you know in a very very simple way of talking so all buddha is asserting is that the badness within us, the unhappy stuff, the fearful stuff, the ego stuff, and we're going to go into this, and this is all very much to do with Tantra. We're heading directly in this direction. You know, the postgraduate approach to this. Is, um, is Buddha, Buddha would say, there's a term they use in Buddhist psychology, and we never use it in daily English life, is adventitious. It's adventitious. It doesn't belong. You can remove it. And the, the goodness within us, love and compassion and wisdom, are at the core of our being. Now, these are simple words, but the implication on them is kind of tasty. But it takes a while for us to get our heads around this because, like I was beginning to talk before, the deep assumption we have is that anger, love, depression, anxiety, jealousy, compassion, goodness, in other words, all the goodness and all the badness, they are all at the core of our being. We're all born this way. And anyway, we didn't ask to get born, did we? And it's not my fault. And what can I do about it? You're stuck with it, you know? So the, a deep assumption in all our psychological models in our contemporary culture is that all of this stuff is uh, necessary components to qualify as a person. So if you analyse what a microphone is and you assert it, you'd, you know, you'd know if it had all these little funny, funny bells and whistles and handles. you know that you could get rid of those and you wouldn't get rid of the microphone nature, would you? Your microphone is still there. So Buddha would say, basically, that anger and jealousy and depression and anxiety and all this stuff that we think are normal, he would say they're like bells and whistles that just don't belong and you don't need them, honey, get rid of them. But we think if you get rid of them, you're an unnatural person. Are you hearing my point? We deeply assume they are normal. So, of course, the implication of assuming they're normal is that you can't change them. And anyway, why would you want to? You'd be abnormal. So we walk around with this terrible conflict, you check it, in our heads. On the one hand, we know depression and anxiety and anger are unbearable. We just absolutely desperately do not want to have them. But at the same time, we fiercely defend our right to have them. You check this out. If anger is so natural and we defend our right to have it, then you check this. The next time Joe punches you in the nose and is angry with you, you should say, well done, Joe. Excellent. Good on you. Anger's natural. I'm very pleased for you. But you do not, you know. You know it's unbearable. So our immediate evidence is that anger, jealousy, depression, these simple, simple words, I'm not talking complicated like bipolar, this, that, IDAD, all these things we invent every day. I'm talking ordinary, simple words, you know, we know they are unbearable. We know they cause our pain. We frantically, desperately will do anything to get rid of them. But at the same time, we truly do not believe we can. I mean, that's a terrible conflict to live with every day, isn't it? And we never seem to, you know, reconcile it. So for me, it's kind of a delight to hear that a person pops up called Buddha and says, you know what, guys? You can get rid of them. You don't need them, sweetheart, because they are painful. Check it out and you can get rid of them. How about that? You, we, sh we should be paying millions of dollars to hear Buddha's advice. It's like a miraculous, you know. It's like radical. It's like outrageous. But you know what? Because we call it religion, we kind of don't hear it as serious. You get my point? We don't really hear it as real. Is this something you believe in, you know? It's very depressing, actually, how we, how we think of it that way. We're so removed from this stuff. Just a bunch of airy fairy stuff in the sky. And anybody's allowed to create their own religion every day, we think. Because who's supposed to prove it? You know, when George Bush tells you that he talks to God, how can you argue with him, you know? You don't, you, you don't want to ask him for his proof. You think you kind of feel like a, spoiling the party. Because that's what we think about religion. Anything goes. Anyone's allowed to say what they like. And you look at the garbage, with respect, from dear human beings, that we publish in books. You had a vision yesterday and you write it out in a book and call it a new religion. No one's allowed to argue with you. Well, it's a bit rude. You know, in science, if you did that, they'd throw you out. Well, that's a very healthy approach. That's the approach that Buddha takes. You know, so you better shut your mouth until you've proven it. But we don't, you know. So Buddha's saying, okay, we all are mind possessors. We have consciousness. Right now, indeed... Anger, jealousy, depression, anxiety, fears, and all the badness are very real for us. So real, and this is why we think they're immovable, because they've been there for so long. 
But Buddha would say they're not at the core of our being and thus can be removed. So don't just believe that. We need to investigate that. And this all just takes time. But it's an interesting thing to want to investigate, isn't it? You know, great. It's the, it's the basis of the goal. <coughs> so essentially the goal, Buddha says, the long-term goal, you know, don't hold your breath, it won't happen overnight, is that each one of us possesses innately this potential to develop fully the positive qualities, and, in other words, to be perfect, and to rid ourselves of the negative. Well, you know, the perfect idea is a bit shocking. My Catholic mum was shocked by that, you know. Only God is perfect. Well, Buddha says no, everybody can become that. That's the major difference in Buddhism. And so all Tantra is, is, you know, postgraduate methods for accomplishing this goal. That's all. That's it. I mean, in one way of putting it. We're going to go into it. So if we are dealing only with the mind, and if the goal is to perfect your mind, to develop the qualities that are called positive, which are at the core of your being, which are the source of your happiness and joy, and the source of your capacity to be of benefit to others, and that your mind can be removed of the garbage, the anger, jealousy, fears, depression, and anxiety, and the low self-esteem and the misery that Buddha would call ego, which is not at the core of our being and can be removed, which it, all of which, is, if all of this is psychological, the process is psychological, the job is to work on your mind, the job is to know your mind, if that's true, and then this stuff is the postgraduate level of that, well, what's this stuff, what's these weirdo people got to do with mind, you know? How come, you know, this green lady over there is to do with my mind? What's that got to do with anything? Well, again, it's not complicated. So, ta for example, you know, this word Buddha, okay, let me first describe a bit more what a Buddha is, you know, Buddha. Or you Americans say Buddha. Don't you say Buddha or something? Yeah. Buddhist. I'm an American now. I should speak like an American, shouldn't I? I say Buddha. Australian, you know? <laughs> Buddha. <laughs> All the Buddhists. You say Buddhists. Okay. So what is a Buddha? Okay. As I said, it's a Sanskrit word. Me, it implies, the first syllable implies the removal of all the junk, and the second syllable implies the development of all the good, you know? So, um, a person who has accomplished that, their mind, which is not physical, has fully developed in that stuff, you know? Okay, before we even go to Tantra, let's look a little bit more at the mind, okay? So one little approach, actually, that's from Tantra, that's a very helpful little model of the mind is, is really necessary to keep in mind when we discuss this stuff okay so if we think of you know in this little model they talk about we've got gross consciousness or mind the gross level at which our mind functions and that includes the sensory through this big bag of bones here and the conceptual which includes thoughts and feelings. In other words, the day-to-day -day level at which we function from the time you wake up until the time you go to sleep, that's the, your gross consciousness functioning. Then you've got what they call in this little model subtle consciousness. And we virtually never access that except when we dream. And then we can see it's kind of wacko time. Dreams are weirdo, aren't they? You can't really go there at will. You know, you don't know what they're all about. You don't have any usual sense of space and time. It seems kind of random. But that's your subtle consciousness functioning. Then you've got even what they call very subtle consciousness, and we never access that. But, and this is definitely Buddhist context, you, are the only, you, do, you do go there every time you sleep and every time you die, which, of course, implies Buddha's view of mind being a continuity that doesn't begin at conception and won't end at death. So we're going to look at two things here. Well, one it's really one. We're going to look at m a little bit more of this idea that Buddha has of how the mind exists, how it is a, a non-physical thing, and how it is not something given to you by someone else. And thus, looking at the question, well, where do I come from? Where does it come from then? Because we only have the view either mummy and daddy make you, you know, or God makes you. So these are, in, these are kind of crucial points to get your head around in order to really kind of work with the Buddhist approach from the big picture point of view. So far so good, folks? Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Do you want a quick little breather? I'm trying to talk slowly. I don't know if I'm succeeding or not. <laughs> I'm talking half the speed as normal. <laughs> so, 
on what we've just said so far, because we're now going to start expanding on this, do you have any little points to bring up? Any questions at 11.22? It's constantly lunchtime. Any, anything? Or I'll just keep moving, yeah? Happy? Okay, good. Okay, so this gross level is actually, when you think about it, all we think of as our mind in our materialist world, you know, and we think it's the brain. The Buddhist way of saying it is this, that that part of your mind, the concepts, the feelings, your eye consciousness, your ear consciousness, they are not physical, but of course they exist in dependence upon a decent working body and brain. This goes without saying, you know. If your hand is cut off, you can't have, you know, with these fingers, you can't have tactile consciousness. If your ear drum doesn't work, your, that part of your mind that functions normally through the medium of the ear can't function. So indeed, your gross consciousness is non-physical, but it needs the body to be working properly for it to function. You get that idea? It's not too complicated, you know? You've just got to get used to thinking that the mind as being separate from your body, absolutely interdependently connected. You cannot argue with that. You can see what we, th and they're more and more now looking at these ideas in the materialist models, especially since the last 20, 25 years of these marvelous conferences that have been held by this organization called Mind and Life with the best brains in the West and the Dalai Lama and the various Tibetan scholars, you know, discussing this whole topic of what mind is and so on and so forth. So these marvelous findings now, so many of these people, their findings have been hugely affected by this thinking, you know, and the, and the, now the findings in this sense, you know, the, one of the most radical findings in the West, but which has been an assumption all the time along with Buddha, that your mind is plastic, meaning the brain is plastic. There was this view that the brain was a fixed thing. Now they're finding on the experiments, not too difficult to prove, of say, for example, these Tibetan meditators, that, you know, by thinking about compassion, by working on your inner self, having positive thoughts and just doing meditations on positive things, that your brain can be, rad it can radically change. And there's so many projects now. At Stanford University, there's this marvelous project called Project Compassion. There's many, many projects everywhere working on the benefits of positive thoughts, the development of them, and how they can impact upon and actually change the structure of your brain. They're proving this now, you know. So we can see that thoughts and feelings and brain are intimately connected, but the crucial point that Buddha's making is that they are not their brain themselves which is the big shift from the, the materialist approach you know and this is a problem for materialist approach because the materialist approach our scientific approach has to have something it can see and if something's not physical clearly you can't see it you know so this is you know but taking it as a hypothesis is a very good way to start so we live at this gross level we can see that so the Buddha's saying this he's saying that this mind of ours has astonishing potential you know, and even forget about the level of potential for good qualities, potential for love and compassion, but c potential for memory, potential for, for intelligence, potential for seeing, you know, seeing past and future. We have astonishing levels of potential in our mind, but at the gross level, we just don't, we can't exercise that capacity. So you look at it, you know, we, we say, oh, don't be ridiculous, a past life, who remembers a past life? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's now 11.26. And if we had to sit down now and write and account for every second of what we have done and thought since we woke up, we would all fail miserably. We probably can remember maybe a few minutes accurately of actually what we've been thinking and doing since we woke up. We don't remember most of today, in other words. Certainly, we don't remember most of this life. So it's not too surprising that we don't remember a past life. But we don't think like this, you know. We think we're so intelligent, we're so capable. But it's a joke, you know. And of course, we don't even think it's necessary to remember everything. Why on earth what should we? What a funny looking thing, you know. But the Buddha would say mind has that capacity. In fact, let's look back a bit here. The, the, you know, let's define what the mind is. So this is a kind of important point. If I say to my mother when I'm a little girl, Mummy, what's a knife? We've heard, I've heard the word. She has to explain very clearly. She's got to define it for me. 
Exactly. Well, darling, it's this long metal thing with a serrated edge on it, and that tells you its character. But if she doesn't tell me the second piece, which is its job, oh, it cuts things. I won't understand what a knife is. I have to have a definition, don't I? So what's the definition of mind for the Buddha? It's got two parts, like I said. The first part of the definition tells you it's not physical. And they use the term, they simply say it is clear or it's luminous, meaning not physical. But the second part of the definition tells you its job. And it's real simple. The function of mind is to cognize, to cognize, to be aware, to merely know. Well, to cognize what? To know what? To be aware of what? Well, that which exists that which exists. So we're going to go and do this after lunch, how the mind mistakenly cognizes things and how this characteristic of mistakenly cognizing things is the main characteristic of our unhappy neuroses, anger, jealousy and attachment, which is how come we suffer. We'll go into this, which blocks us from becoming who we really can be. But the point I'm trying to get at here, and I've lost my point, I'm going on so long, I need a little editor in my head, <laughs> um, yeah okay yeah the gro- okay I'll go back to that one at the gross level which is where we do function it's just the tip of the iceberg it's the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg of our mental capability and I don't just mean being like an autistic person who can you know add up 47 kind of digit numbers in their head but at enormous level we have this remarkable capacity Buddha says for this mind to cognize that which exists at whatever level, emotional, intellectual, whatever, a phenomenal potential. And that we can begin to access when we've accessed the subtle level of mind, which, for the Buddha, does not need this body for its existence. The cross level does. And now, lots of people, some here, no doubt, have very vivid dreams. Lots of people have leaving their body experiences. Lots of people have clairvoyance, can see something in the past, can see something coming, you know. So many people in every culture reports this kind of thing. But we don't take it as serious in science because it doesn't fit with our model of a brain, you know. We can't find the clairvoyant bit in the brain. But this fits perfectly with the Buddha's assertion about the capability of mind based upon this view of the Buddha that consciousness itself isn't physical. At the gross level, it can't experience things like that because this body and the nervous system and the brain are kind of so gross they get in the way of the mind, of the mind's capability. So using these marvellous psychological techniques, as I'm discussing, called meditation, which Buddha took from the Hindus, you know, it's pre-Buddha. They're happy to share, as I point out. They've been around for thousands of years, these marvellous techniques for what they simply call concentration. We all need that. Oh, my gosh. And they're not religious in their nature. I mean, I always point out communists could do them. They're not religious in their nature. They're just very marvellous, skillful techniques to enable you to completely, and I mean completely, harness the crazy energy of this mind of ours. And this is something interesting too. If we look in our contemporary world and our view of what the mind can do, there's no talk about trying to control it. You know, your mother tells you, control yourself. It doesn't get time to tell you how. It just says, shut your mouth, you know, and your little mind's going crazy. You're exploding in there. And we don't learn as we get older. We all have to be on drugs now to keep our all our ADD or whatever it is down, controlled, isn't it? We haven't got a clue really in the West, with respect to us. But these marvellous techniques have been around for centuries of how to control your little mind. I mean, my God, we should be so ha- we, Again, we should be paying millions of dollars instead of to the drug companies, but to little Buddhist teachers to show you how to control your own little mind for no dollars. That's it. I'm not kidding here. I'm really not kidding, you know. Astonishing capacity, Buddha says, for clear conscious uh, don't and don't make it sound religious please i don't mean airy fairy rubbish i mean clear precise focused un, you know unberserk harnessed disciplined light spacious focused levels of mind so simple hard work but possible it's the natural potential of all of us, Buddha says. And to the point where when we really accomplish these marvellous methods, we can access this subtle level, which for us just seems so abstract right now. Astonishing capacity. And at that level of mind, quite literally, you have the capacity to cognize phenomena that the gross level can't. That is to say, the past. 
that is to say, the future, that is to say, someone else's thoughts. And I'm not kidding here, you know. This is called simply clear voice, clear seeing. For the Buddhist approach, no big deal, you know. But for us in our culture, with the brain being the only thing, it sounds wacko and mysterious and superstitious, you know. But for the Buddha, it fits. It just fits. So all I'm pointing out here really is this amazing potential, just potential for the capacity for co of cognition of this mind of ours. And then not to mention even more subtle levels, you know. Gross, subtle, very subtle. So at this gross level then, the level we function at day to day is conceptual. And that, surprisingly, for the Buddhist psychological model, includes emotional. And I was going to say that after lunch, but it's only 11.33, mm -hmm. I've got time, I've got to do it now. And this is getting to understanding our neuroses, which are the obstacles for our becoming who we really are, are the obstacles for our getting a focused mind, and the obstacles to our achieving our goodness. These are the ones. And so at the, at these, and this is sort of like talking high school here. But let's go to junior school first. Given that the job of a Buddhist is to work with their mind and transform it to become who you naturally are, this marvellous, compassionate, <coughs> wise, clear, astonishingly de developed person, given that that's your job in the long term, you know, then the very first thing, which is, this is junior school now, the very first level of practice is real simple. Zip your lip and keep your hands to yourself. Don't harm others. It sounds a bit sort of ridiculous even, but it's sort of obvious. Look at the world. Just check the world. I'm dealing with people in prison, okay? Our Liberation Prison Project, you know, we work with people in prison, have now for 14 years. We get something like a 1,000 letters a month from people in prison. And Garen, and I believe you me, they're not in prison because they had an angry thought. The ones who did do something naughty, you know, take away the ones who didn't do it and got wrongly accused. But the ones who did do something naughty, they did it with their hand, most likely. You hear my point here? Their hand and their feet. They took something that didn't belong. They said, they didn't, even for saying words, you don't get in prison. It's harming others that you get in prison, taking things that don't belong to you. You with me? Well, that's behaviour, isn't it? That's your body and speech. So as your grandmas would tell you, behave nicely. Well, that's the first level of practice, Buddha says. Behave nicely. Don't harm others. And you can see the world. It is impossible. I can see for myself as a kid, you know, who expressed every angry thought she had through her mouth and used her fist. She wasn't a passive aggressive, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I got into trouble because of my behaviour. I could see all the nice little good girls who were the passive aggressives and I knew they were. I didn't have a word for it, but I knew they were as angry as I was, but they didn't express it, you know. So they didn't get into trouble. They were the goody goodies. You get my point? So behaviour is a major thing. And it's the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? So if we can't behave, if I, you know, until I began to control my mouth, that didn't start until I was probably in my 30s after I'd been a Buddhist a few years, and even now it's a struggle, how could I control what was behind it, which is the anger? It's sort of obvious, isn't it? So it's not rocket science, really. It sounds very simple and down to earth. The first level of practice is begin to harness your behaviour. Don't lie. You know, Buddha's got a little checklist. <coughs> this is where Buddha's morality comes in. You know, your little checklist of don'ts. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't badmouth. Don't this. Don't that. And it's not because Buddha wants you to, which is the usual religious view we have. Buddha's reason is very practical. Buddha says, sure. You know, what is, and this is, okay, this is interesting too about what morality is, and this is a fundamental point in what we call religion. So the Christian view of morality is very clear. It's what God says you should do, because he is the creator. Well, let him have it. It's his job. So what morale, I asked a friend, Catholic friend of mine in Australia, what is a sin? He said it's that which goes against the will of God. That's very reasonable if you have a creator. But the Buddha, being not a creator, that's not his view. But if you even think of the materialist view of morality, it's the same as the Christian one. What is wrong is what mummy says not to do. So when you're a naughty girl is when you went against mummy's will, isn't it? That's why we think we can get away with things. If mummy didn't see it, I won't get caught. But this whole dualistic subject-object punishment-reward model, we have it in the materialist world and we have it in our Christian teachings. But that's not the Buddhist one. 
It's a bit like, you know, when I was a little girl, my mummy probably said to me, don't go near the fire. And I probably, being a smarty pants, would have said, why not? And she probably answered, because I say so. Hmm. Well, guess what? As a little girl, that was very helpful, wasn't it? That protected me. I didn't have enough common sense to realise the real reason not to go near the fire is it would burn me. You're with me, people. But my mother, you know, that was reasonable. So we tend to think that's what morality means. So that's why we have all this rubbish guilt, you know. So sort of like here I am getting on for 64. I'm Sagittarius. Six months' time I'll be 64. So let's just say, and I'm still saying, oh, I mustn't go near the fire because mummy said so. (laughs) Are you with me, people? You'd feel a bit sorry for me, wouldn't you? Because <laughs> that's what we think of as morality. That's why we have all this pathetic guilt. We, we, you know, because we're really just blaming your mother because you're just not brave enough to take responsibility. Well, the Buddhist view is he's not a creator. He's more like the he's like the he's like my mother warning me, Rabina, don't kill. First of all, honey, they don't like it. Just check it out. Do your market research. No one likes to get killed. You check the ants and the dogs. You watch their body behaviour. They don't like it. So that's a good enough reason not to do it. So in, first of all, in Buddha's view, what's called a bad action is what harms others. It's not because Buddha made it up. It's very reasonable. You just check out the world. It's easy to establish what is immorality. Immorality is doing things to others that they don't like, like taking their money and punching them in the nose and sleeping with their, sleeping with their wife. It's very simple. This is the logic of morality in Buddhism. It's not a thing made up by the Buddha. It's not coming from on high. It's a, it's a thing you can establish quite quickly using your intelligence. Are you hearing my point here? So, you know, you, you be reasonable. So the very first level of practice is, Buddha says, Rabina, sweetheart, I would suggest you don't kill. He's like a doctor warning me. Rabina, he says, don't smoke. Not because I say so, because if you look at the consequences, you will suffer. This is, again, a very interesting point and fundamental to Buddha's view of the universe, and it's called karma. He calls it karma, you know. It means action. It implies the law of cause and effect, action, reaction, cause, result, seed, fruit. He didn't invent it. Karma doesn't just apply to religious things. Karma is the term that Buddha uses to refer to this natural law that we all live according to. We call it botany when it's your garden. We call it cooking when it's cooking. But it's a natural law of cause and effect. You learn the laws of that thing. You know that if you do this and this and this, you'll get that. Well, that's called cause and effect. We all know it. It's called science. Buddha happens to refer it to also morality. And his key application of this law of cause and effect is in this point. So his advice is at the very first level of practice, Rabina, he's got his checklist, don't kill. First you establish killing is not good because it harms others. But then he says, because you see we're not created. (coughs) Buddha says we're not created by anybody. Your mind is its own thing. Your mind is its own thing. It's its own entity and it belongs to you. And its contents are yours. So the the quality of your mind is determined by the contents. The anger in it, the love, the kindness, the jealousy. And that stuff is yours. Yes, your brain plays a role. And yes, indeed, your mummy hitting you plays a role. But there are only cooperative causes. The main point of your mind is your own, it's your own stuff. So the law of cause and effect applies here in a very simple kind of organic way. Real, real simple. So right now, <clears throat> let's say I'm angry. Or let's say I'm unhappy. Rubina, what's wrong? Why are you unhappy? Why are you angry? And I'll say, what's your name again? Joe, Joe that's right, there's Joe. That's right, there's Joe, I forgot. <laughs> I thought there was something. There's Joe, okay? So, and I'll say, because Joe hit me. Okay? That's the logic we use now, isn't it, for why I'm suffering. As far as we're concerned, there's one reason for my suffering, there's one cause of my suffering, and it's called Joe. That's the lo- logic we all use now. So now let's, now, now let's say I'm good at piano, and I'm playing the piano, and you say, why are you good at piano, Rabina? And let's say Joe's my music teacher. I would not answer, it's all Joe's fault. He taught me. We wouldn't answer that, would we? What we would say is, well, what do you think? I'm good at it because I practiced hard, because music is my potential, because I've got this tendency to play music and I've practiced and practiced and practiced to perfection. Yes, I thank Joe because without him being a good teacher, 
cooperative cause, I wouldn't be good music. I thank Mr. Steinway for making such a nice piano. I thank, Mr. I thank Mr. Mozart for writing such good music. So in other words, there are various cooperative causes, aren't there? The pianist, I mean the teacher, the piano, and Mr. Mozart. Without which I couldn't be a good pianist. But we know very well that I am the main cause. Wouldn't you agree with that? my own potential and then I've exercised it. Well that's a very reasonable presentation of cause and effect. But look how irrational we are when it comes to emotions. Mm. And so, you know, all Buddha's saying is Joe's punch is a cooperative cause, you know. The various other factors of what happened today are cooperative causes, but the main cause of my anger is guess what? My own potential to be angry. Very simple. But everything in us doesn't want to know about that because we, we are in the blame mode. And it's our philosophy. It's deep in the bones of our being. So this view of karma, which we understand in our ordinary world when it comes to music and cooking, we lose the plot completely when it comes to happiness and suffering, or as we call it, morality. Do you get my point here? So this stuff is really like the nuts and bolts of Buddha's philosophy. And if you've got your nuts and bolts clear, you all know you can do very well then. So we, what we tend to do, like I was saying before, we, we bring all our theistic religious views, and I'm not criticizing them, but that is very different. We plonk them into our Buddhism. So we carry in the guilt and the shame and think we've got to do it because Buddha said. And all this is so fundamentally mistaken in Buddha's view, you know. So the view of karma is this in relation to the mind, in the very practical sense of what your mind is. This might, you think of your mind as a, you know, as, as this these series of thoughts and feelings I'm having right now. So it's like a river of mental moments. Well, where did this moment of, you know, where's all this moment of all my thoughts and feelings come from? Well, the previous moment of them. You can track it back, didn't you? If you had perfect memory, you could track it back to yesterday morning. And then if you had perfect memory, you could track it back to when you were a little girl. And you know there's this unbroken chain of mental moments, aren't there? Unbroken. Each of the moments in your mind comes to the previous moment, comes back to the previous, comes back to the previous. Now you get back to a conception. If you're Christian, the first, you know, you didn't exist the moment before conception. You were a twinkle in God's eye. And if you're a materialist, you didn't exist before the moment of conception because then you were only a twinkle in your mummy's eye. You with me, people? So we both, therefore, say they created Ravina. The Buddha would say, no, they didn't. They were co God's not a cooperative cause at all. Buddha thinks that's a mistake. Just take it as a hypothesis. Cool. Buddha has nothing to do with it. But your parents, no doubt, definitely had something to do with it. They worked very hard to get that egg and sperm together. <laughs> Isn't it? So then, you know, but the egg and sperm are just cooperative causes. They're just your body. But Buddha would say, if you track your own consciousness back as an entity, not the body, your consciousness, your, your series of thoughts and feelings, you keep tracking it back, you're going to get back inexorably to the first moment of conception. Well, obviously the question is, what was the cause of that moment of my consciousness? Well, it's real simple. The previous moment. So this consciousness, did in, so it went into that body. Okay, all sorts of explanations from the Buddha. Explanations of how come my mind went into my mummy and daddy's womb as opposed to Joe's mummy and daddy's womb, you know? But the whole, the Buddha's emphasis is that my mind is mine. I don't need creating. So when you, you will then say, well, when did I begin? Because we assume there has to be a beginning. Well, Buddha says this is a dumb question. What on earth do you want a beginning for? And he says it's not logical, it's irrational anyway. Why? Real simple. If you posit cause and effect, the law, doesn't that imply there is a fruit? And if there is a fruit, we know there was a seed. No question about that. And if we posit a seed, we know it came from a fruit. So you can't find a first seed, can you? Because if there is a first seed, where did it come from? Very simple. It's the question we ask as kids if we dared. Where does God come from? Buddha's very simple in this. It's an organic law that he says is really natural. It's like gravity. It just occurs. He didn't invent it. He's not speculating. It is his observation. He says it just happens naturally. It doesn't need running by anybody in the sky. It's just a natural law. So mind, a con the, mi the continuity of mind exists according to that law, Buddha says. So with, with this in mind, you cannot find a first moment of your mind. Not because Buddha can't see it, but because it doesn't exist. So this is a nutty idea. It's an insane idea to us. Buddha basically is asserting that minds are beginningless. But for that matter, so is matter. As the Dalai Lama said, Big Bang, no problem. Just not the first Big Bang, that's all. 
Because, of course, things have a relative beginning. If we had perfect, you know, knowledge of this microphone, we could deconstruct it, we could deconstruct all the parts, we would know exactly the moment it switched on and became a microphone. You know, three and a half minutes past seven on January the 7th, 2008, when the final screw was put in. It began then. But it didn't come out of the sky like that. It wasn't, a, it wasn't created by somebody as a magic thing, was it, that had no, had no cause. The cause of it was this, its matter, which came from this, which came from that, and the plastic came from this, and the plastic came from that. You keep tracking it back. Same with the mind. So indeed, you can track this universe back to its first moment. And if they're clever enough, the scientists doing now can indeed find the moment this universe began. But, you know, all the Buddha's saying is that matter, and the way they use in this esoteric model from Tantra, that matter is simply made up of the four elements, like the, you know, the Mr. Galileos and those folk back in those days used to think of it. It's still the model they use in the Buddhist one. Matter is made up of the four elements. Well, you know, it all, it, it subs these four elements subsume down to a subtle wind energy. And the beginning of this universe was this wind energy that had imploded from previous universes. And then the coming together of the karma of all the billions and billions and trillions of sentient beings who, who have, you know, our collective karma, literally our actions have been the energy that have created the cause for this universe to come together as these elements with the trees looking like this and the universe looking like that and the, and the, and the mountains and the seas and all the rest. I mean, there's no time to go on about the whole history of the universe here in this for lunch. <laughs> but I can try. So basically, you know, Buddha is saying matter does not get created. It has always existed. And the form it takes is the karma of beings. And minds have not begun. This is why Buddha is not just being argumentative when he says there's no creator. He just says there doesn't need to be one. His philosophy is quite different, you know. All of this is absolutely crucial to understand the big picture. We're getting to the tantric one, you know. This is the background to give some kind of philosophical, practical context to understanding how come you can become Tara, become Vajrasattva, these beings, these words. I'm going to go into it and the meaning of it psychologically. So, okay, to summarise before lunch. Using the tantric model, actually, there is matter made up of the four elements that have no power from their own side. This is an interesting point. The physical world talks about only matter and has all these, it's got its own power, you know. The Christian world talks about God and how God controls everything. The Buddhist view would be there is matter, but it's inert. What causes it to manifest in the way that it does is the karma of all the trillions of sentient beings. Because karma, finally, as far as Buddha is concerned, which means mental actions carried out by bodies and speech. Mental action. Intention. The word intention and the word karma are synonymous in Buddhist psychology. Action. Mind. Intention. Everything comes down to mind for the Buddha. Everything comes from the mind. Everything is created by mind. It sounds cosmic. We can't get our head around that. But the more we look into the Buddhist approach, the more this has, uh, you know, is a reasonable po uh, proposition, you know. So all the more reason why we need to know our minds and why we need to develop, poten you know, to develop this potential. Because it comes down to our own selves being the creators of our own selves. And I'm not kidding. It's a simple way to put it. Whereas you check the materialist world, I didn't ask to get born. It's not my fault. My mother and mother, just father decided to create me. You know, if I'm, a, if I'm a Christian, it's not my fault. God created me. Well, both these ideas, the more you internalize the Buddhist approach, for the, for the Buddhist approach, these are very strange ideas that someone else creates you. It's a bit like Frankenstein creating his monster, you know. It's just the wackiest idea for the Buddha. Each being is the fruit of their past thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Each person now, by thinking and feeling and acting and doing what we do, we leave seeds in our mind, impressions, reverberations, seeds, you know, that will then produce in this mind tomorrow, next day, or next life, past this body, whatever, because mind is also endless. It's experiences. So we are the creators of our own experiences, Buddha says. And this is absolutely central to Buddhist philosophy. And eventually, as we internalize that, to psychologically, it's an outrageous concept. You know? We are the creators of ourselves, so that means I can change. 
and turn myself into whatever I want to turn myself into. Not just like that overnight. It takes a while to counteract the deeply held mistaken conceptions of ego that think I'm hopeless, that think it's not fair, that think I'm a victim, that think people do it to me, that think I didn't ask to get born and it's not my fault and how dare they. That's deep in our bones right now. Victim is our natural state right now. It's the meaning of ego in Buddhism. Poor me. Self-pity me, as Lama Yeshi calls it. It's the meaning of ego. It's kind of ironic. The term in French, I remember I was there last year, I'm going again in the summer, in July. But the term in French, the translation of that one, they say, pauvre petit moi, poor little me. But you check, and this is fascinating, <coughs> we'll go into more of the psychology of this after lunch, but you look into how it feels behind your anger, your pride, your jealousy, your low self-esteem. It's poor little me. And I'm not being cruel to us. It's the nature of ego. Even a person who's a bully and violent, it's their poor little baby me freaking out, you know. I mean, the harm we do from the poor little me is terrible. Look at the world. But it comes down to poor little me. And the very philosophy we live according to is embedded in this, you know. The philosophy of someone else did it to me. And our whole view of the universe is this one. Mummy and Daddy make you. I mean, I know this sounds hilarious, but if you follow that through, that philosophy, you are right to blame your parents. But we're so conflicted. We think, on the one side, my mother and father literally created me. But somehow, I'm, I have to forgive them. Well, excuse me, why should you? If they really did give you anger and jealousy and depression, and if they made you, they did, then you have a right to blame them. I'm not kidding now, you know. You do. But we, we kind of conflict it again. We think, oh, I shouldn't blame my parents. I should take responsibility. What for? They made you. Let them take responsibility. And in fact, how dare they make me and give me anger and jealousy and then plonk me out on this earth and tell me to take responsibility? I mean, it's completely outrageous. <laughs> you get my point? But we don't, again, we have this big conflict in our heads, you know. Or as Buddha says to Rapina, honey, you made yourself, babe. Don't worry about it. Oh, what a relief, you know. No one to blame now. It's such a relief. Because it tells me I can change. How fantastic. I think Buddhism's great for control freaks. I love it. <laughs> you made yourself. Oh, I love it. Okay. Five minutes of questions before lunch, okay? Five minutes of any question whatsoever up until this point. A bit of a summary of Buddha's sort of the background, the nuts and bolts of Buddha, so we can give some tantra some context. Yes, darling. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. I'm going to tackle this question about this changing the mind. Okay, darling. In terms of living in the United States and this cultural concept that we have that it seems to be so bad to change one's mind and really? this is particularly no in the reference to the political situation that we're now in where um you know john mccain says oh he's flip-flopped he's flip-flop he's changed oh, his mean, mind oh, I that kind of thing. that and level of change and i mean no right. obama changing his mind about the financing right oh, yeah and so you're so good at this the what <laughs> what's a great way to uh, you I know try to ch to change people's mind that it's fine to change your mind no, oh, I understand. You, know, it, no, you no, know what's the comeback what's no, the okay. comeback that you're no, good okay. about I think that. we have to define our terms a bit more here isn't it I think the way we use the word change your mind in the west is what you just said oh he's always changing his mind like you're, you know you're, you're not living yeah. according to your principles yeah. but wait but the one I'm talking about here has got a slightly different meaning hasn't it it's got a different meaning, darling. They're two different discussions oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. But you're just interested in this one. <laughs> <laughs> you're so good at coming up. I mean, you know, Sweetheart, explaining okay. things that okay. I would love to be okay. able to, okay. uh, you know, with it. I understand. Give. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's look at that one then. I think, yeah, okay, what we tend to do in our culture is get very rigid, don't we? And we hold positions. And we can see it expressed in politics. 
So you have a position. You're called a Democrat. And that means you have to believe this and this and this and this and this. And if you actually dare to agree that George Bush might be good on something, you're, you're like a terrible sinner. You've almost been thrown out of the... So that's the rigidity of our mind. We're very fixed. And we call it sticking to your principles, don't we? Well, but that really is, is nonsense, you know. So then what we call non-partisan, we then think, you know, is a bit sort of sneaky. You've got no principles. You disagree with anybody. But the reality is this, it seems to me. If you have a principle called not killing, let's say, well, that, it has to be based in reality. It has to, in other words, the Buddhist view, it has to be based in morality. It has to be a principle that you, you live according to it because if you did it, you'd harm others and it would be not a good thing to do. Not just because you think it's a good thing, I don't believe in killing, but it's a practical thing. So... If you do have a principle called not killing, then it would be something you would never go back on because it's, it's going to be harmful to sentient beings. But if there's another principle that said, I support public financing for whatever it is, then if you see there's a practical benefit to changing your mind about that that isn't going to harm sentient beings, then of course you can do it. It's very reasonable. It's perfectly reasonable. But we get fanatic about a principle. It's just a bit ridiculous, you know. So that's the point. But that maybe is not the answer you want. You want something more simple than that. But it's got to be realistic whether it's going to harm others or not. So the fact that you say, I like carrot cake, doesn't mean tomorrow you can't say, I like chocolate cake. So what will happen is with our fundamentalists, oh, but you said yesterday you like carrot cake. You're always changing your mind. <laughs> well, excuse me. It's cool. You can be nonpartisan about it. So the point is, it has to be something practical. If, you know, if one minute he says, I, believe, I don't believe in killing fetuses, and then he realises you'll get a lot of votes because if he says he does believe in killing fetuses, well, then you can say he's flip-flopping. That's sort of... Sn it's using a wrong motivation for changing his mind. So, again, another one is the motivation. Right. <coughs> what? I agree with everything you've okay, said. So then? And it's fine with me that yeah. Obama changes his so mind. Then? What I, I would... <laughs> love with your wisdom for a, a saying that you can say to those to the fundamentalists who who are saying that that's wrong you know to be flip flop or whatever mm -hmm. yeah. something that comes up and says what do you, want, you, mean you want me to say more I've said enough I can't say more I can't say more I'm not going to say more you're going to have to come up with yourself you've got wisdom <laughs> thank you that's cool yeah, of course it does, yeah. That's exactly what I mean. It's sort of really so clear, you know. It's just so... But I think the thing is, there's a fanaticism about a position. You've got to stick to your position. You know, you keep changing your mind. People tell me that all the time. I probably do. Change your mind all the time. Yeah, anyway. I know. Yes, go. Yes. Take the mic. I like to think a lot. And, uh, well, that's good. And, go on. Yeah, and and, and uh, I've come up with, with a way of describing um, uh, the basic... My, what I think is a, a basic dichotomy between two cultures. I call one the culture of reasonableness, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm very happy to hear you using that word so much. Yes. The other is the is what I call the culture of confusion. Yes. And uh, I think they're profoundly different. But in order to really appreciate the culture of reasonableness mm. and enter it, you mm. first have to go through the culture of confusion within yourself. Well, I think that's our starting point, isn't it? Yes. It's like you don't know math, you're confused, and you've got to go towards knowing it, which is reasonableness. Yes, exactly. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. That's our starting point now. Buddha would agree. He calls it ignorance. Yes, confusion. We haven't got a clue what's going on. That's right. Absolutely. Thank Good you. on you. Thank, Thank you. you. The gentleman behind back there. Did you have your hand up? Okay. Thank you. Go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, you were... I, it was very interesting what you were saying about uh, victimization being the sort of state and uh, mm. of mind and being in the modern era, and mm. you know that leads us to blame uh, our parents or society or whatever. Mm. And I'm just curious if there's a risk um, because of, of karma. If there's yes. a risk of of blaming uh, karma and sort blaming of yourself, you mean? Well, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean that's very much. I see. I think yeah. Of course there is because as long as we have. The you know not trying to sound fancy the dualistic view that there is punishment and reward and blame and victim then of course if you have the very strong blame mentality let's say and you 
like lots of Catholics give it up and then all they do is talk about all the guilt and they blame God and blame the nuns and everything they give it up and now we go into Buddhism and you, keep, you carry the same thing through and so instead of that you're now going to blame yourself because I must have done it now so as long as you have the concept in the first place this dualistic view of victim and punishment you will always have that of course there's that danger of course there is but so the thing is not some, karma isn't the problem or even God isn't the problem it's that we think you're a victim is the problem and so if the, the idea of karma and it takes time to move from the victim view is opposite to that it's sort of like the idea we all know that if you made your bed you've got to, you got to sleep on it if I grew those crummy seeds in my garden I can't blame anybody else if I smoked all those cigarettes every day I can't blame the Marlboro company for my cancer I've got to take that's what taking responsibility means not like a heavy burden it's a growing up thing if I know I did that I have to own that so what's interesting in the Buddhist approach to how we what they call what we call purification which is this psychological process of changing we have this thing called guilt and one and, and we often use the term in Buddhism you, your first step is you have to regret that you did something so okay the Dalai Lama was asked one time what's the difference between guilt and regret. It was very simple. He said, guilt is looking into the past, saying, I did this, I did that, I did this. And then you say, and I'm a bad person. Right? Now you look at blame. You did this, you did this, and you did this, and you're a bad person. That's called blame to other people. That's the problem. But he says, regret is, I did this, I did that, and I did do this. But then you say, what can I do to change? That's the taking responsibility. Now, I remember Martin Luther King, I love it. He said, it's okay to blame, to be angry. You did this and this. But instead of just, you're an evil person and kick and scream, you then say, what can I do to change it? That's the key. So the taking responsibility, the karmic one is, you know, if you have a garden that's full of weeds and you're the gardener, I'm sorry, you have to own the fact the presence of those weeds proves you didn't do your job properly. And if you scream and shout and blame the plant makers and blame God and blame the sun not coming out and blame everything else, which is what we do, that means not taking responsibility. It's scary to take responsibility. And that's what blame is. And it's called guilt or it's called anger. But this one is more dynamic. It does own the fact, I, there's the proof. Look, there are the weeds. I mustn't have done my gardening. Drat. But then you say, okay, what can I do to change? And that's the key to success. So it's a very courageous attitude. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So you, it's all right. <laughs> go. Um, I have a diff um, question about reconciling different religious practices. Yep. Um, I was baptized Catholic, yep. and my grandmother on my mother's side is Catholic, and my grandmother on my father's side is Buddhist, and both very devoted um, women, very um, calm, never raised a temper, perfect, you know, grandmothers. Um, and I've been trying to reconcile, you know, with two different religious practices. Mm. And um, like a couple of months ago, I started reading about um, the Medicine Buddha, and I'm really drawn to mm. uh, Medicine Buddha yes. and meditating mm. and visualizing mm. him. Um, and uh, one of the things I do is... Um, like uh, visualizing washing his feet with you know rose water and then drying his feet but then I started thinking well but Jesus has also been very good to me so it's not fair I just wash <laughs> medicine Buddha's feet I should also <laughs> wash Jesus' feet and then, then I thought but Mother Mary is also very good to me so I should also wash her feet <laughs> so, so then and so I and I, I kind of feel like m maybe my I'm kind of like stumbling uh, you know, along know. my path. Well, maybe you know, <laughs> so, okay, so one Buddhist approach to this would be it's sort of like you know you can kind of like you can love Jesus you can love me Our Lady I mean I love Jesus I love Our Lady I love the Catholic Saints I read all about the Catholic I mean I'm always reading all the news about the Catholic Church it's my history it's my background I haven't rejected it in one sense mm -hmm. although I, when I did say to a Catholic priest I met in Los Angeles. Uh, and he looked, and I said, I still feel like a Catholic. He looked gobsmacked at me and he said, Well, you could come back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what else to say. You know? But it's sort of this, it's this non partisan thing. It's okay that if you like carrot cake, it doesn't mean you have to hate chocolate cake. If you're like a Democrat, it doesn't mean you don't like something the Republicans do. We get very fundamentalist. So because you like Buddha, doesn't mean you dislike Jesus. And if you really have a pure view, 
Buddha is represents Jesus and Mary as well. They're all the same, you know. At a big level, they're just different manifestations of the same pure energy. And in that way, you can relax. And you just think of having Mary and Jesus there too in your mind. It's cool. You're not like, it's not, it's not like this either or. And that's the very dualistic view we have. And that's the fundamentalism, you know. And we do it in our own lives. I'm right. No, you're wrong. You know, you are, but you said that before. It's sort of like fixed mind. It's a fixed mind. And it's just very silly. There's no reason to see contradiction, in other words. Okay. Buddha's, Medicine Buddha incorporates Jesus in, our, in Mary. But you've got to decide, eventually, it's a bit like you've got to choose one boyfriend. You can't have six husbands. <laughs> it's just not like that. <laughs> so you, maybe you've got to decide you love them all, but you've got to choose one. When you're eventually ready. So the Buddhist one, when you're ready to take refuge, as they call it, it just means, you know, if you really love Jesus, then that's cool. But if you think Jesus' teachings are the best, then you've got to take refuge in Jesus. Because Jesus says you can kill things, but Buddha says you can't. That would be a conflict. So you can choose Buddha, but also like Jesus. But you've got to decide finally. But there's no hurry. Right. But they all mean the same. Then you just be skillful in how you see them. It's okay, you know. Right. You understand? Um. Yes. But you've got to follow what works for you. And clearly, if you have this wish to wash their feet, you sound like a little Buddhist to me, like a little <laughs> Buddhist lineage in there. So you just follow it and see where it takes you, you know, okay. with a very open mind. Okay. Really, there's no dualistic uh, thing. And a related question is that if I want to go deeper yes. into meditating um, mm -hmm. on the medicine Buddha, yes. is there certain empowerment that I need to take? Absolutely. We'll talk all about this after lunch, sweetheart. Okay. I'll go into this after Thank lunch. you. I'll pass it. Okay, good. Um, th on the question of morality, it's, yes. it's very interesting because uh, mm -hmm. uh, living in this country, any country, you see day to day, you can watch Fox TV anytime. You have two people of the same religion reading exactly the same book, and one says we should go to another country and bomb them. That's right. The other, according to the book. Yes, that's right. The other says, I read the same book you do, that's right, and, and I got the exact opposite no, point. It. It's not like they have mm. the different Ten Commandments. That's right. So uh, how do we go wrong? I mean, like you couldn't cite a different... It's not like he was reading verse 1 and that guy was reading this verse 2. This is why two. the Buddhist yeah. view would say that you have to come down to be able to proving it experientially. It doesn't matter what the books say. And if you find the Buddha's wrong because you've proved it, then you reject him. So the Buddha's view of morality is not a thing that a person said was right or wrong. The Buddha says how you see that something is called negative, an action, is simply an action that harms another. So if we go more deeply into that, look into the minds of a person who punches or shoots or steals, and that is the source of it, which is the wish to harm. That's what harming is. So, But even just the action itself, if it harms another, that's what is meant by immorality. And that's not too difficult to prove. Just go ask people, do they like being stolen from, killed, lied, or punched in the nose? It's not too difficult to prove in an interdependent sense. It's really uncomplicated. That's how Buddha determines what morality is. It's not a fixed thing in the sky that comes down from God, you know? So books can say what they like. You see my point? Yeah. Anyone else before lunch? Yes, over here. Yes, darling. Come on. No, for the time for taping. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, I had a question about um, you were saying that we our mind is our own and that we own our minds. I'm curious what happens then on the subtle level and then the idea of emptiness, where there is no I, there is no creator of negative karma, no action. No well, we can talk about that after away. lunch, but that's there. Okay. Basically, just as a little thing to think about while you're eating your lunch, we'll go into this. That's a misconception. That's Buddha would say that things exist in a conventional sense. So what's your name? Uh, Lourdes. Lourdes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is Lourdes, and we define her as this and that, and we can discover that she isn't Joe. So we can see right now there are a conventional reality of there's a Joe and there's a Lourdes. Okay, we have to first establish that there is something that exists in a conventional sense, by agreement, you know? There are these. Then we look into how Lourdes exists, and that's when we come to the emptiness thing. So saying that there is no Lourdes from her own side intrinsically is what Buddha's saying. Not that there is no Lourdes, because what you just said then was there is no I that creates karma. There's no I intrinsically, but that doesn't contradict there's an I. I, I guess I was um, more curious about going from gross, level, oh, gross levels of mind 
I'm suicide. not discussing that. That's another discussion, though. Okay. That does n doesn't come in there. Okay. That's another discussion. Okay. So that's just enough for lunch. You can okay. discuss that. You can think about that over lunch. So listen to me. Over lunch, you're going to get your lunch out there. <laughs> so kind of keep make it like a seamless part of the day. So if you want to be silent and just go and think about these things and you be silent, don't have this compulsion to feel you've got to talk, you know, just because you're in a group of people, which we tend to do. But on the other hand, if you want to talk, then don't just talk about George Bush and these kind of things. You can do that afterwards. So try and carry on the conversation, if you can, you know, without looking all serious about it. But, you know, have fun. You're allowed to talk to each other and say what your name is and everything. But, you know, if you can carry on the conversation and make it after, even after your lunch, maybe sit down, group of three or four of you, and just nut out a couple of the things we've discussed and then have some questions later. And we'll go into the... We'll get to the tantric bit then. Is that okay? While you're enjoying your lunch? But now, given that Buddha's wanting us to think differently about everything, because he says we've got all these misconceptions, let's think differently about our lunch. Let's think. There's all that stuff out there called carrots and lettuce and no doubt, and bread and butter and soup and who knows. And it's all in a certain shape and form. But then think, you know, it's... Um, it, these sentient beings have made it and lots of creatures have died for it so just think of it in a very spacious way and be delighted but then also think of it as just oceans of nectar not just one little plate of lettuce just for you and you think of then the main thing is now to think that you happily if you would you could offer it to others so you visualize just imagine in the world be very spacious full of beings so all the suffering ones all the little creatures all the starving ones all the human ones all the holy ones all the beings all the buddhas pervading space and you imagine all of them delightedly experiencing the pleasure of this food which you happily offer them thinking just like that lama sange lama chö dejen lama gedun te gong gi jay po lama te lama nam la chö pa bul and then you eat your lunch happily eat and discuss and I'll see you in an hour and a half or something yep about that <coughs>